All right, uh, hello everyone. Another in our series of uh, great thinkers, the great writers and the great thinkers of all time. We can call this a, a layman's conception of the great thinkers, I suppose. Um, another fascinating person. Um, it's a person that I studied in college quite a bit, um, as being a psychology major. Um, Sigmund Freud lived from 1856 to 1939. He was an Austrian neurologist who became known as the founding father of psychoanalysis. Um, many people thought that his ideas were a combination of genius and um, delusion. Um, and uh, just a little bit crazy, especially with uh, his theory of um, the... Um, um, that uh, that um, uh, what's the what's the theory called where the boy wants to kill his mother to or kill his father to marry his mother things like that a little bit a little bit off he was a little bit off with that and uh, apparently he was he was um, he was high on cocaine a lot of during a lot of his writings too which is kind of weird to think of that. Um, Freud's parents were poor, but they ensured his education. Uh, Sigmund Freud chose medicine as a career and qualified as a doctor at the University of Vienna, subsequently undertaking research into cerebral palsy, aphasia, and microscopic neuroanatomy at the Vienna General Hospital. This uh, led in turn to the um, well led in turn to the award of a university lectureship in neuropathy. Uh, post he resigned once he had decided to go into private practice. On the basis of his clinical practice, Freud went on to develop theories about the unconscious mind and the mechanism of repression and created psychoanalysis, a clinical method for treating uh, psych uh, psychiatric illness uh, through dialogue between a patient and a psychoanalysis. Freud postulated the existence of libido, an energy with which mental processes and structures were invested developed uh, therapeutic techniques such as the use of free association in which patients report their thoughts without reservation and in whichever order they spontaneously occur. Discovered transference, a process by which patients displace onto their analysts feelings based on their experience of earlier figures in their lives and also established its central role in the analytic process and proposed that dreams help to preserve sleep by representing sensory stimuli as fulfilled wishes that would otherwise awake the dreamer. He was also a prolific essayist, uh, drawing on psychoanalysis to contribute to the interpretation and critic, critique of culture. I remember studying Freud in college and it was just a very, very, very tough, very, very abstract thinking. Um, it was very, very hard to understand some of his his views like um, catharsis and um, he had to buy into um, you know this theory of the superego and the id and the ego um, it, it does make some sense though when you think of a superego which is sort of the, the parent part of the brain and then the ego is the decision maker and the id is this wild cauldron of primitive thinking where the dreams come from. And, um, psychoanalysis remains influential within psychiatry and across the humanities as such it continues to generate extensive debate notably over its scientific status and to whether it advances um, or is detrimental to the feminist cause. That's interesting. I have never heard that argument before where whether psychoanalysis was detrimental to the feminist cause. Um, Regardless of the scientific content of the theories, Freud's work has suffused intellectual thought and popular culture to the extent that in 1939, W.H. Auden wrote in a poem dedicated to Freud, To us he is no more a person now but a whole climate of opinion under whom we conduct our different lives. Um, and then I get my reference information from Wikipedia here. But just scratching the surface of this fascinating person named Sigmund Freud. In October of 1885, 
Freud went to Paris on a fellowship study with Jean-Martin Charcot, a renowned neurologist who was conducting scientific research into hypnosis. So, um, a lot of people say that the crazy part of Freud too was uh, was hypnosis, that he overemphasized hypnosis and in the ability to to uh, to cure hysteria and to cure neurosis and to um, and, and just stepping back a bit too and talking about um, psychoanalysis, I think there are studies out there that that um, there are differing studies on whether psychoanalysis is actually effective. Um, I remember studying in uh, Dr. Alexander's class at Ripon. Um, you know whether there were some studies saying it's 50/50 whether psychoanalysis is is effective, and of course that may have changed since 30 years ago. But now, on the basis of his early clinical work, Freud postulated that unconscious memories of sexual molestation in early childhood were a necessary precondition for the psychoneuroses obsessional hysteria, a formulation now known as Freud's seduction theory. Some of, some people think that that's a little bit off, the seduction theory. By 1897, however, Freud had abandoned this theory, now arguing that the repressed sexual thoughts and fantasies of early childhood were the key causative factors in neuroses, whether or not derived from real events in the child's history. This would lead to emergence of Freud's new theory of infantile, infantile sexuality, that led to the Oedipus complex. That's that's what I, the term I was trying to remember, where the boy wants to kill his mother and marry his father. Or <laughs> that would be that uh, that would not be right. I'm sorry. Uh, dispose of the of the father and marry the mother. But I suppose um, that would be a homosexual Oedipal complex, right? The other way around. Um, not laughing at that, but I'm laughing at that I messed it up. Uh, Freud's uh, development of these new theories took place during a period in which he experienced several medical problems, including depression and heart irregularities. Freud had heart irregularities. I didn't know that. Freud began exploring his own dreams and childhood memories. He would actually analyze his own dreams. During his self-analysis, he became aware of the hostility he felt towards his father and also became convinced he had developed sexual feelings toward his mother in infancy. Um, Richard uh, Webster argues that Freud's account of his self-analysis shows that he had remembered only a long train journey for those duration, uh, whose duration he deduced that he might have seen his mother undressing, that Freud's memory was an artificial reconstruction. Uh, after the publication of The Interpretation of Dreams in 1899, interest in his theories began to grow and a circle of supporters developed. However, Freud often clashed with those supporters who criticized his theories, the most famous of whom was Carl Jung. Part of the disagreement between them was due to Jung's interest in and commitment to spirituality and occultism, which Freud saw as unscientific. So, uh, the Jung, Carl Jung was uh, believed in God, um, and Freud was more the scientist. So, you know, when you look at being the pure scientist, Freud comes out way ahead of Jung, in my opinion. Of Jung is the archetypes, and um, uh, Jung believed in uh, this concept called synchronicity. Synchronicity, is it? Which is just really way out there. I mean, it's just way, way out. I don't believe in synchronicity. That would be something interesting to discuss on a YouTube, a future show, though. What is synchronicity, and why do people believe in? Uh, why do people believe in horoscopes? Right? Synchronicity is a fun thing to believe in, but it's probably not true, in my opinion. Karen Horney, a uh, pupil of Carl Abraham and Freud's most outspoken critic, opposed Freud's theory of femininity, leading him to defend it against her. Uh, the disagreement was how to interpret the concept of penis envy rather than whether it existed. Uh, Horney understood Freud's conception of the castration complex as a theory about the biological nature of women, one in which women were biological castrated men rejected as scientifically unsatisfying. Horney's uh, opposition, along with that of Melanie Klein, produced the first psychoanalytic debate on femininity. So, 
Cornet was interesting in that she was the one to raise her hand and say, hey, you know, this is not right. Uh, um, this is not right. Uh, it, uh, it, this is overtly sex sexist that um, that you're saying that it's almost as sexist, openly sexist, as the Bible saying that the women come from a rib of Adam, um, which is just terribly demeaning. Um, um, so it, it, that Karen Horney pointed that out is very appropriate, I think, in my opinion. Um, yeah, let's see, what else? Uh, it talks about early followers and uh, the early psychoanalytic movement, famous patients, struggle with cancer. I wanted to find something on Freud's drug addiction, but um, I guess we don't. We can't. There's nothing. Oh, there's cocaine. Um, as a medical researcher, Freud was an early user and proponent of cocaine as a stimulant as well as an analgesic. He believed that cocaine was a cure for many mental and physical problems, and in his 1884 paper on cocoa, he extolled its virtues. Between 83 and 87, he wrote several articles recommending medical applications of cocaine, including use as an antidepressant. He did introduce cocaine to his friend Ernst Marxo, who had become addicted to morphine taken to relieve years of excruciating nerve pain resulting from an infection acquired by performing an autopsy. Wow, that's weird, huh? However, his claim that Fleischel Marxo was cured of his addiction was premature, though he never acknowledged he had been at fault. Um, and then um, Flexel Marsho developed an acute case of cocaine psychosis soon returned to using morphine, dying a few years later after suffering from intolerable pain. And the application as an anesthetic turned out to be one of the few safe uses of cocaine. After the cocaine episode, Freud ceased to publicly recommend use of the drug, but continued to take it himself occasionally for depression. In this period, he came under the influence of his friend and confidant Fleiss, who recommended cocaine for the treatment of the so-called nasal reflex neurosis. Fleiss, who operated on the noses of several of his patients, also performed operations on Freud in one of Freud's patients who he believed to be suffering from this disorder. Um, let's see. So, in his work on dreams, too, and the meaning of dreams, um, he will be known for um, for a long time. Uh, Sigmund Freud regarded the monotheistic God as an illusion. This is his thoughts on religion based upon the infantile emotional need for powerful supernatural pater famili familias. He um, maintained that religion, once necessary to restrain man's violent nature in the early stages of civilization in modern times, can be set aside in favor of reason and science. Obsessive actions and religious practices notes that likeness between faith and neurotic obsession, uh, a relation between, a correlation between faith and neurotic obsession. Um, and so that saying that people who are religious are sort of you could another term for that is neurotic obsession. He wrote several of his papers uh, addressed this neurotic obsession. Um, so and then uh, so Freud died in uh, in uh, 1939, I believe it was. Yeah, mid September 1939, Freud's cancer of the oral cavity was causing him uh, increasingly severe pain and been uh, has been declared inoperable. So at that point, uh, it was pretty much um, a done deal with uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, after reading uh, Balzac in a single sitting, Freud turned to his doctor friend and fellow refugee Max Schur, reminding him they had previously discussed the terminal stages of his illness. Schur, you remember our contract not to leave me in the lurch when the time had come. Now it is nothing but torture. It makes no sense. When Schur replied that he had not forgotten, Freud said, thank you, and then talk it over with Anna. And if she thinks it's right, then make an end of it. Anna Freud wanted to postpone her father's death, but Schur convinced her it was pointless to keep him alive. On the 21st, 22nd September, administered doses of morphine that resulted in Freud's death. Um, so that boy, look at that! And that's something that I didn't know that Freud um, 
that was a uh, that was a uh, a suicide uh, planned suicide. Three days after his death, Freud's body was cremated at uh, North London. Ernest Jones gave the funeral or oration, and a gathering of friends, psychoanalysts, uh, uh, psychiatrists, Austrian refugees, including the author Stefan Zweig. Freud's ashes were later placed in the crematorium's columbarium, whatever that is. They rest at the ancient Greek urn that Freud had received as a gift from Princess Bonaparte, in which he had kept in his study in Vienna for many, many years. After his wife Martha died in 1951, her ashes were also placed in that urn. So, just scraping the surface um, of um, somebody named Sigmund Freud. Um, and uh, just a very interesting uh, interesting that um, uh, two things I didn't know about Freud is that uh, that he committed suicide and uh, um, also that um, of his anti-feminist bent was quite interesting so um, there you go Sigmund Freud for whatever it's worth um, and uh, it'd be interesting to have a talk with my my father who's a retired psychiatrist and, um, I, I just remember uh, my dad making just some generic comments about how Freud was kind of crazy in a lot of ways, but brilliant in other ways. And often people can be brilliant and and then crazy. Um, and uh, you know his ideas, especially with uh, regard to religion being a neurosis, is very interesting. His ideas on uh, I think he was right on with. Uh, Super ego, ego, id, and uh, it's a great way of um, seeing our, how we function. I think it's a great, clear way to see how we function. So, so there you have it, Sigmund Freud, in a, just a very humble layman's interpretation.